Welcome, everybody. Welcome to pretty much all parts of the world. Um, welcome all attendees from Malaysia, India. We have a strong group from uh, UK, where, where I know many names and there are a couple of friends uh, with us. So um, I'm really, really happy uh, to welcome you to this outstanding uh, seminar today. And uh, um, we want to give you some advice today how uh, we're going to proceed and how the webinar is going to work today. Okay, we, after my brief introduction, we go straight into part one, OCT in glaucoma diagnostics. You know, you will learn everything about the optic nerve head today you could possibly think of. And uh, it's a trilogy, so we have three parts of roughly 30 minutes, and the main discussion will be at the end. Um, you have um, various opportunities to interact, but before we come to that, I want to uh, introduce our Virtual Academy webpage, which uh, allows you under this URL to uh, follow our courses. This is just the pilot or the, the start of our international program, and, and uh, you can follow on this page the most up-to-date talks if you like. So now, how can you interact uh, to this um, meeting? Uh, you can either um, ask a question by typing, typing using your keyboard, as you see below here, this line. And we have a huge team behind who tries to answer your question as they arrive. A few, really a few questions will make it to the panel or to the discussion with Professor Martin. And uh, we try not answer questions to answer after the symposium. And uh, last but not least, we hope it will be super interactive at the very end. And I will give those priority who raise their hands. I see some people playing already with that function. If you raise your hand, you will be unmuted. And everyone uh, can hear you, including us. And we can answer your question, have even more interactive discussions. So I encourage you at the very end of the presentation, or whenever I encourage you to raise your hand. I will um, delete all hands before that discussion so we don't have any um, randomly clicked um, choices uh, at that point. OK, so last but not least, um, a little uh, email address where, where you can write all questions about uh, Heidelberg Engineering and our educational program, of course, and again, the web page. So now it's my pleasure to go live to Erlangen University to Professor Martin and hi, Christian, and uh, welcome uh, to the live webinar. Uh, the fans are, so to speak, waiting uh, for you. And uh, I see the presentation is, um, uh, is, is up. Maybe you go to presentation mode to, so we have the full screen. And then um, after that, uh, I'll disappear and uh, give you the sign to start. Christian, go ahead. Now everything is fine. Great. Thank you, Stefan, for the invitation to this webinar. We are, have a partition in three parts, each part 30 minutes. Um, good afternoon, good morning, and of course, good evening all over the world. And we are dealing with glaucomas and other optic neuropathies with this small talks. So we have a special time, and I'm lucky not to wear this mask. I have to wear all day long, so we, I can speak up to you. And uh, we have to take care of Corona, and therefore we are separated from each other, but we can listen to each other, and you can see the lecture, thanks to the good technique from Heidelberg Engineering. So let's get started. The first part will be about OCT in glaucoma diagnostics. And first of all, we start with the introduction. Then we deal with how does OCT present anatomic measures? And then what are typical glaucoma test changes? To begin with, we know that normally when we do ophthalmoscopy, we see the surface of the optic disc and the retina. And when we turn into a Superman by using an OCT, we are able to look into the tissue and look all the anatomic structures we are interested in in order to diagnose and uh, follow up glaucoma. Uh, 
As we all know, we have a very high resolution with OCT, and, and this one-to-one -one, um, comparison between in vivo OCT and histology after removing the eye due to a malignant melanoma in this patient, you nicely see that all the anatomic structures we see in histology, the retinal pigmented epithelium ending up here, the edge of the sclerum rim, and also the ending of Brooks membrane, all is there, of course, the nerve fiber layer and the neutral rim and all the retinal layers. So all the interesting structures could be imaged, like the ganglion cells, axon thickness, and even choroid and RPE ending, ending of Brooks membrane. In order to use this technique, we would like to see something we haven't um, looked in before. And when we use the visual field side, we have done it for, uh, for decades, not for centuries, but for decades, we know that when the visual field defect appears, it's rather late. And following the glaucoma continuum of Weinreb, which is in my eyes still a very good graph, we are able now with OCT to detect glaucoma and other changes at this layer of the rainbow with ganglion cell axon loss, retinal nerve fiber loss. And we know 30% of this tissue has to go away before we have detectable white on white perimetric field defects. So now we are able with OCT technique to look a little bit earlier into the disease. Also the economic burden for glau of glaucoma therapy and early diagnosis pays when we use uh, early diagnosis. In the very early stages, glaucoma detection, also the therapy, of course, is rather cheap. The more progressed the patient becomes, the more, the higher the costs are, and the higher is the burden for, for um, a nation's economy. So how does the spectralis present anatomic measures we are interested in? When we look at the normal person on the left-hand side and a glaucoma person on the right-hand side, we see that the neutral rim and the nerve fiber layer in glaucoma fins and tissue is lost. So we are able to, by thickness measurements, to give some idea about the atrophy happening. That's not only true for the optic disc, but that's all also true for the macular. On the left-hand side, again, a normal person, on the right hand side, a glaucoma patient. And you see that the ganglion cells on the right hand side in the glaucoma patients, the layers are thinner than in the normal person. And this is also measurable by OCT. The ganglion cells we, found, we find in the macula are, of course, the offspring of all the axons leading to the brain with all the visual information. So when we use OCT, we measure the neutral rim, we measure the retinal nerve fiber layer around the optic disc, and in a 20 degree field, in a cube, we are able to measure retinal thickness, ganglion cell thickness, and other layers. So first of all, we are able to measure the neutral rim. The, the machine finds the ending of the Brooks membrane opening, and then the shortest distance to limiting membrane is then the thickness of the rim. And if you perform this at 48 measuring points, you get a good idea about rim thickness. These measurements of our patient are then compared to a normative database. And then you see the, in yellow, the 95% percentile, 99% percentile in red. And you can uh, look at each measuring point, whether your patient, according to the sectors of Garber Heath, is still in the normative range or not. When we look at the retinal nerve fiber layer, we are able to use two ring, uh, three ring scans around the optic disc with different diameters. And again, we look at the B scan and the comparison with the normative database, and again, the sectorial analysis due to the sectors of Gauwe Heath. The third is then look at macular layers, and especially in the ganglion cell layer thickness here in red. And 
here the thickness is indicated using colors in the posterior pole imaging with very warm colors red yellow showing thicker layers very cold colors green to blue showing thinner layers so taking all of these three measurements uh, into account we are able to have a holistic morphometric approach to the disease this is a nice paper already published in 2010 showing eminence-based medicine by experts towards in comparison to evidence-based medicine using machine at that time the ggx vcc and the hrt and in the judgment of the optic disc stereo slides of healthy and diseased persons you see all these experts taking part into the study had a wide spread of their ideas about what is healthy and diseased the machines were very good in judging um, healthy and diseased patients and if we do an overlay with our nowadays our spectralis we see the nerve fiber layer still has the best performance polar panganglion cells and minimum rim width at the base of Brooks membrane opening. So what are typical glaucomatous changes? Also in contrast to the uh, third part of our talk uh, when we deal with neurological changes to the optic nerve. So in our opinion, the, cha the changes occurring in the optic disc are due to a barotraumatic damage due to the relatively increased intraocular pressure. So the retinal nerve fiber layer, nicely indicated here, 1 to 1.2 to 1.4 million axons leading from the retina to the optic disc have their offspring in the ganglion cell layer here. That's the third neuron in our retina, sending back, back a very long axon through the lamina cubrosa of the optic disc, through the lamina cubrosa pores in bundles, going to the lateral geniculate nucleus. So when we look at this histology slide of a healthy optic disc with the nice layered lamina cubrosa and the axons and demyelinization, the optic disc widens up, the optic nerve widens up. When pressure is exercised on the optic disc, then the structures show atrophy. We have a loss of astrocytes. We have a loss of axons. The optic nerve thins behind the globe. And we, have, uh, we end up with a complete cupping of the disc. The loss of nerve fibers happens here in typical bundles mainly situated in the temporal superior and temporal inferior sectors here prefer, uh, preferably in glaucomas the nerve fibers are lost and this flags up for example in the scarwell heath report in the temporal superior and temporal inferior sector with a thin retinal nerve fiber layer when we look at to this image of the macula of the ganglion cell of two ganglion cell types sending the axons to the optic disc we realize that the m cells the m ganglion cells sending the axons to the optic disc typically end up in the temporal superior and temporal inferior part of the optic disc where nerve fiber layer is lost until the end the papillomacular macularia bundle is preserved mainly consisting of the offsprings of the parvocellular cells. Again, this graph highlights what he has said. So the damage occurs preferably temporarily inferiorly, temporarily inferiorly, and then we have this wedge-like nerve fiber layer defect showing us the way to the ganglion cells lost, mostly on the temporal side of the fovea, either in the lower or in the upper hemifield. Luckily, most of the ganglion cells are found in the macula, in the area we do our macula scan. So we are able to measure ganglion cell loss in the cause of the disease. 
When we look at a spectralis two printout of the this right eye here, we what to do and how to react to this many colors and images shown here. So preferably in our routine, when mm. we look at this printout, first we look when we want to decide whether the patient is still normal or has a beginning glaucoma, we prefer the retinal nerve fiber layer and look whether there is already a defect. And here we see in a temporal superior sector of um, a uh, very thin nerve fiber layer beyond the 99% percentile. And in our opinion, nerve fiber layer is still one of the most sensitive measurements of OCT in early stages of the disease. Then, secondly, we look at the mineral rim width at, measured at the book's membrane opening. We look at our graph, at the Tisnet graph. And then, finally, we look into the ganglion cell layer at the posterior pole and look whether the ganglion cell layer thickness fits to our measurements of the nerve fiber layer and the mineral rim width. And interestingly here, the wedge-like defect here in the nerve fiber layer is not highlighted very much in this nice donut of even macular ganglion cell thickness. When we look at the infrared picture, we get an idea of the cupping of the disc um, being very similar to the view we have on the optic disc. And here we see that we have in the upper part and the inferior part a pronounced thinning of the neutral rim and an enlargement of the cupping. And of course, the ganglion cells, I prefer to take as a kind of referee if mineral rim width and retinal nerve fiber layer doesn't show the same direction for the diagnosis. And finally, of course, we look at the asymmetry, not only between the right and the left eye, but also between the upper and the lower hemifield. Here we look at the typical picture of a glaucoma patient with all the measurements we need to um, judge and grade the patient. So this is a 52-year-old lady, primary open-angled glaucoma, and at the optic disc photograph, and we still use the photographs because this is still for us one gold standard of imaging because it gives the image in the same way we see and judge our patient. Here we see an optic, uh, the thinning of the neurotic rim in the typical temporary inferior part with a notching of the rim with an old hemorrhage in this area. Corresponding to this loss of rim, we have a field defect in the upper hemifield. When we look at the retinal nerve fiber layer, this focal defect is nicely mirrored with this temporal inferior sector between being in red and the thickness going down in comparison to the normative database. Interesting enough is that minimum rim width flags up ne red nearly all the sectors, much more pronounced than the retinal nerve fiber layer. We will discuss this fact later. When we look at the posterior pole, of course, fitting to the rim loss temporarily inferiorly, we find a thinning of the ganglion cell layer here directly fitting into the picture. And the latest um, the latest image is the deviation map. I prefer very much because they give a very good impression what happens. The posterior pole is rather focused to the center, but in the deviation map, we'll see that the patient has lost a lot of ganglion cells and the area of thickness loss is much more pronounced in the, as a, in the posterior pole. And in addition to that, if you want to get the correlation to our thickness findings with the visual field, we can go into the Hood report, which shows our ganglion cell map upside down, and we nicely can correlate the loss of the ganglion cells with the loss of visual field in the upper field, as shown here in the white and white parametry with the octopus device. This is a typical picture of uh, glaucoma, glaucomatous atrophy, not beginning, but 
patient is already in the middle of its disease. So now let's apply our knowledge to a case which was provided to me by Martin. Martin Long is a very, a very experienced professional in the field and he likes to send pictures and we like to discuss the pictures. So here it was not clear what kind of atrophy the patient might have. We have here the mineral rim width, we have here the retinal nerve fiber layer, the ganglion cells. So first of all, we realize that the BMO area, the area of Brooks membrane opening is rather large. Normally we have in the mean value of 1.8 square millimeters, here we have 2.4 square millimeters. So it is, it's a larger disc. When we look at the mineral rim width, we see that we have a temporal thinning of the neutral rim. And if we lighten up a little bit our infrared picture, we nicely see the corresponding thinning of the rim to the temporal side as imaged in the infrared picture. When we look in the retinal nerve fiber layer, we see the typical loss of nerve fiber layer thickness in the temporal superior, temporal inferior uh, sector. And again, most often the papillary, papillary macularry bundle is preserved for a long, long time, perhaps because M cells die before of P cells. That's always a point of discussion. And of course, the ganglion cell layer shows a very pronounced atrophy and has become very thin. So if there's a doubt whether the patient has glaucoma, I would say with all this evidence, we would say it is 90% glaucoma evidence for this right eye of this patient. We have seen the discrepancy between the nerve fiber layer thickness measurement uh, flagging up and the BMO MRW flagging up. So we found in a paper in 2018 in IOVS that we, if we look at pre-parametric patients, for example, with a small and a very large BMO area, we realize that mineral rim width in small discs is a little bit more sensitive to detect glaucoma than in large discs. Here in large discs, it's most often the retinal nerve fiber layer being a little bit more sensitive. So you see, according to the disc size, and of course, according to the disc form, there might be some discrepancy in flagging up glaucoma between minimum rim width and uh, retinal nerve fiber layer. Therefore, I always prefer to look into ganglion cell layer thickness. Progression is a very important item. So we have the course over four years in a healthy, in glaucoma with progression, in glaucoma without progression, according to the visual field and optic disc. And what we realize is that even the patients we thought were, were stable had double the progression rate than a normal with a, a retinal nerve fiber layer loss due to age. Here's an example of a patient 2008 to 2013. And if we compare both images, we realize after this cameras, we have a notching temporally inferior. And if we look at the event-based analysis of the nerve fiber layer, we realize that from 2008 down to um, 2013, the patient continuously has less lost retinal nerve fiber layer in this sector. If we look in the trend-based analysis, we realize that the patient has also lost neurotherapy rim, but in the global analysis, that's not as well highlighted as we would take the event-based analysis. That's due to the global statistic we use in this patient. But all the same, the patient has lost minus 1.4 millimeter of retinal nerve fiber layer thickness. And this is, in this case, statistically significant. And that's a very good clue in order to judge whether the patient has lost nerve fiber layer or not. In this case, we um, collect all our knowledge again together. We have 2014, 16, 17. And we, if we look at the clinical picture of the patient, we realize that we have a loss of Nerve fiber layer here and the small dark notch becomes a little bit larger in the course. When we look at the visual field, it's interesting that um, first in 2016, we have a nasal step flagging up 
that the patient has a problem with the white on white perimetry. But again, in 2017, this appears a little bit less pronounced. When we look at the progression of the nerve fiber layer of this patient, here nice again, the notch in the original nerve fiber layer thickness, we realize that the patient already loses a nerve fiber layer in a very early point of his disease, that's 2012. That's the old measuring ring centered of the optic disc. And with the G uh, GMP from 2000 to 17, we realized that the patient at the same area has lost thickness and the yellow turns out to red and it becomes more clearly visible in the temporal inferior quadrant when we do the anal statistical analysis than looking at the global analysis. Here the trend doesn't say much, but here the trend is clearly showing a loss of nerve fiber layer. Of course, when we do a little bit of flickering, it becomes very clear that the patient is losing nerve fiber layer thickness in the area of this notch, and this notch in the infrared picture becomes larger. What's with the minimum rim width? Also, the minimum rim width in the course of 14 to 17, this patient flex out the progression again, more pronounced when we look at the uh, temporary inferior sector analysis. Again, when we do our flickering exactly at the same point where we uh, expect the defect, we see the slight filling of the rim in this area, beautifully shown in the B-scan picture of our patient. What's with posterior pole? Well, was posterior pole from 2014 to 19 doesn't show any significant change. Let's look at the deviation maps. In deviation maps 2014, we already see a slight uh, area of ganglion cell thinning. When we look at 2016, the area becomes larger and for the first time we have also the thinning of the nerve fiber layer flagged out in red here. In 2017, the area becomes a little bit more compact, a little bit larger, and the nerve fiber layer loss becomes a little bit more pronounced. And in 2019, the area really has enlarged and the nerve fiber layer loss has deepened here. So I think before we pass to the glaucoma tips and tricks, we are having a five minute break. And Stefan, do you have a question? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh... Christian, for uh, this excellent presentation, we don't only have one question, we have a couple of questions. Um, and so I'll ask you the first question coming from, from the audience. How can I integrate the spectralis in a very busy glaucoma clinics? Um, um, I mean, Erlangen is a very busy glaucoma clinics. Are there any tips for streamlining, testing, strategies, and output? Maybe you can share with the group how it is organized in Erlangen. I would guess this um, question comes from Australia, isn't it? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> no. Well, in the second part, I have a own slide dealing with this topic. Uh, what to do, because we all know that the um, recording of the images takes some minutes in both eyes. And in a busy clinic, that's a problem. So. My uh, proposal, and that's I will show a slide in the second part, is that you have do a kind of profiling. So in very early suspects, ocular hypertensive or glaucoma suspects, I don't use all the measurements. I first concentrate of the retinal nerve fiber layer, and uh, depending on the stage of the disease, I add more or less examinations. I will show that in the second part in the slide. Very good. Um, we have another question, um, which I think uh, has been discussed a couple of times in various as from various aspects. How long would disc hemorrhages be expected to persist and be seen, for example, when you can assume is a new hemorrhage? Well, most often after six weeks, um, the disc hemorrhage should have gone, but we know that patients uh, repeatedly show disc hemorrhages at the same place. So when you see the patient after half a year, it might be you still see a hemorrhage at the same place, but most often it's not the same hemorrhage, but it's a new hemorrhage. 
And this indicates that the patient will show a fast progression. Most often after four to six weeks, it should be gone. Okay, clear answer. And now uh, a question which is, I think, perfect for you, Christian, uh, coming from a friend in India, um, very good friend, actually. Is Hi to India, I, we didn't see for a while. Actually, there's two questions. Why? The first one is, why not just concentrate at RNFL? Why do all the other stuff? Is number one question. So, um, especially when you have early glaucoma, nerve fiber layer is still the king. You're completely right. But if you have more progressed cases, you have to look more in the ganglion cell layer because the nerve fiber layer, we will show, see later, um, doesn't flag up any progression anymore. And the second thing is, in order to have a differential diagnosis towards other neuropathies, I always use the three measurements, ganglion cells, rim width, and nerve fiber layer, in order not uh, to confuse a glaucoma with a simple optic atrophy, for example. Okay, differential diagnostics, exactly. Um, the second question from the same source, what is the effect of signal strength on progression means the quality? How, how affects the quality? Do you have any idea? Do you have long-term data, don't you? That's um, also shown now in the second part of the talk that quality is very, very important. And if you have a, a very poor signal um, strength and much noise, then I would leave out in the course of the analysis this picture and concentrate on the good ones it has a very big influence on the segmentation um we have another uh, one which is often discussed in, in in these circles which is about the floor effect of the rnfl does the minimum uh, rim width comes in the second, part. Comes in the second part comes in the second part comes in the second, the part. The second okay. part all the questions will be asked Okay, second part, I postpone that to the second part. Um, um, thank you for the informative talk, so uh, a positive comment in uh, general. Which layer is affected first at early stages, nerve fiber layer or ganglion cell layer? Well, um, according to the image we have of the glaucomatous optic atrophy, that the damage happens in the area of the optic disc, that's the first damage should be at the original nerve fiber layer. Uh, you have seen in my example of the course, the patient with the notching temporarily inferiorly, nicely thinning of the rim, nicely thinning of the nerve fiber layer, but still the posterior pole did not react in this patient because the ganglion cells atroph uh, show atrophy after the atrophy of the nerve fiber layer. That's the way we understand the disease nowadays. So it may happen that the ganglion cell layer comes a little bit later in the early stages. Okay, good. Um, uh, sometimes the global analysis does not match the sectorial analysis. So you have yellow or red in the sector, but not globally. Is this due to issues with the normative data bay or is this a normal effect? Well, that's a normal effect due to statistics. I will show also in a second talk. Okay, second talk and no artifact. Um, According to all the capabilities of the instrument, why can we not follow up patients only by OCT and why do we still need visual field? Especially in very progressed cases, um, the rim width and the nerve fiber layer doesn't flag up anymore. You don't see any progression because the layers have thinned so much, but then the visual field will show still progression. So progression analysis with visual field for very much progressed cases. And the other thing is that when you have to educate the patient, the patient only is interested in his um, performance. And the main performance is visualized by the visual field. But you can so show with the visual field, man, this is your visual field, take your drops, go for surgery, because car driving is uh, endangered. So it has also something educative doing visual fields in early stages. Uh, yeah, and maybe very last question is MRW, the mineral rim ridge measurements require accurate marking of the relevant structures. I think the post membrane opening point. How accurate yeah. is this between different operators? Um, 
I don't think that's so much a problem of the operators. We have tested this uh, with Heidelberg Engineering, but it's uh, uh, the mistake the machine does. When we have a segmentation error, the machine is rather consistent in doing the same error again, if you do a short time repeatability. And um, if you have really difficulties with zone gamma in myopic eyes, then of course you get an um, interpretation between different operators differently, that's right. But if you have a nicely marked ending of Brooks membrane, um, the reproducibility is rather high by the operators. Okay, it's time for the break. We have a few more questions. We will, I will mark about normative database and dense cataract. And uh, now um, uh, we keep that for, for the next round. Thank you, Christian. Uh, everyone has a quick break for whatever. Be back in five minutes. So you, you see the counter on the screen and I'll appear in five minutes. Okay, see you soon. Welcome back, everybody. Um, I apologize for the counter. The counter was sleepy today. He didn't want to count. Nevertheless, the time goes on and we all have watches and clocks and uh, we don't wait for the timer to count down. <laughs> we, uh, we move on. Um, excellent first part. And Christian, uh, I can hear you and I stay with you until you have your presentation up and running. Uh, and here it is perfectly, no, almost, almost there. One more time, one more try, one more click. Yes, here we are. Lovely. Okay, so we, we move on uh, with the presentation part two, and we have lots of questions, and I'm looking forward to the second round. Here we are. Tips and tricks. Stefan, thanks again. So second round about um, glaucoma diagnostics, tips and tricks. So the first part will be about what to pay attention to in OCT image acquisition. What are glaucoma-associated artifacts? And last of all, what are non-glaucoma-associated factors? So we have to take into account that we are dealing with an image. Of course, it's not a reality. But of course, when we want to judge a patient and do a diagnosis, images change everything. So the most common artifact we find is the simple segmentation artifact, although we have a very good an image B scan, the machine does a mistake, and this nerve fiber layer thickness ends up much too thin. And if the operator does not correct this mistake, the patient will be flagged out as borderline or even pathologic and perhaps not well treated. So, first of all, we have to correct, of course, for this segmentation artifact. The second thing is clipping artifacts, and especially in myops. Um, it may happen when we are too close to the patient that the upper half of the image is clipped. And if we have such a clipping artifact, of course, then we also end up in a much too thin retinal nerve fiber layer, and we diagnose the patient then as being pathologic. But that's always a problem of the operator and hey, it was me in this case, would not count. Another good trick um, I learned is using in patients with catachronus of with dry eyes or surface problems of the cornea, the Simon's lens. It's the same lens we use for yak capsulotomy. And the authors of this very nice article show um, images before using this optics in performing a spectral a spectralis scan and then after using the optics you see uh, the segmentation is much much better image quality is better and all the detail visibility is much better in this example from a nice colleague from the netherlands we see a problem uh, with dry eyes and a very blurry picture of the nerve fiber layer and of the macula by using the lens the image becomes much sharper, details are much better visible, and also uh, measuring of the whole nerve fiber layer becomes more um, reliable. And this is a very nice case from my friend Valentina Apostolo from the Netherlands, who has really very much 
a very close looking into B scans spectralis and really a good spectralis fan, always coming up with new findings. In this case, we have discussed in the question round, we have a patient who is flagged out in green, but on the fundus image with infrared, we see loss of neutral elf um, retinal nerve fiber layer, you see here and here. And all the same, we see here everything flagged out in green. In the B scan image, we find the same areas as a pronounced thinning of the nerve fiber layer. But also in the comparison to the normative database, the same in the double hump pattern, these are really thin areas of nerve fiber layer being pathologic. And again, we look to the left hand side and still everything is fine. So, what has happened here? Between the Garway Heath sectors, lie these focal thinnings of the nerve fiber layer. So concerning the statistic of the whole sector, the effect is very small, so small that it doesn't much influence our measurement with the GABA heath sectors and the patient is not flagged out correctly. Therefore, we always have to look at the B scans. And if we don't do this, we might end up with a so-called green disease as nicely published here in 2016 by colleague Syed, um, where segmentation errors are, and interpreting errors by the machine are one reason why patients don't show their atrophy as we would expect it. And we don't have always to rely on the comparison to the normative database, but we have to look at the B scans. Here, for example, we have a difference between the centering of the nerve fiber layer circle scan by hand in the, in the old fashion to the center of the disc and with the um, glaucoma module using the Brooks membrane opening as a center. You see that the, now the scan has shifted a little bit to the left hand to the temporal side, to the temporal side, and that when the interpretation of the nerve fiber layer becomes a little bit different between these both imaging modalities. Here we have a 3.4 millimeter scan, a 3.5 millimeter scan, here the 4.7 millimeter scan in, diam in diameter. So this make, uh, could also make a difference and therefore it's wise if you do follow examinations to stick to one method, either to the old scans or at some time start with a new scanning type, but then I always would take for good follow-up the old scans also and do both. So we have to achieve the best possible scan and image quality by correct positioning of the patient's head, of course. That's something the operator has to do, use true track. We have to place the lens in the best possible distance. We have to be aware of the tear film and the cornea surface. We can do, use the Simon's lens, but we have to be aware of to have a second person holding the lens or doing the imaging because uh, we are not Shiva with six arms and six hands. So we need then someone holding the Simon's lens. So target fixation to, should be facilitated. That's always a problem in one-eyed patients. Here you have to be very patient. Illumination is an issue, especially if you want to have a good image quality and of course image focusing. The patient has to have a correct um, position, you have to have a correct positioning of your scans of course, especially when you do the free circle scan positioned on the optic disc center. And you have of course always be aware of the reflective error, especially of astigmatism and sometimes you have to correct with astigmatic glasses and to get a better image quality. Always check the segmentation with the B-scan. So what are now glaucoma-associated artifacts? When we look at this patient, we see a progress glaucoma with a notching temporal inferior uh, on the temporal inferior side. And when we look at the infrared picture, we see the swatch-like defect of the nerve fiber layer. 
everything is flagged out in red in the original nerve fiber layer thickness. And when we look at the nerve in the um, 20 degree macular scan positioned um, to the fovea, then we see that the original nerve fiber layer has thinned. We also see that the ganglion cells have thinned in this heat map, but this is the um, inner nuclear layer and the inner nuclear layer seems to be thicker than normal. What has happened? We go back at the B scan and we realize that this patient shows in the area of nerve fiber layer thinning, a cystic widening of the inner nuclear layer and a thinning of the ganglion cell layer. This, if um, happens in glaucoma, this is often seen in multiple sclerosis patients, but also seen in other optic disc atrophies. And this could sometimes confuse the total retinal thickness measurement because thinning of the ganglion cells, widening of the inner nuclear cells means that retinal thickness has not changed and is not flagged out. Therefore, if you have a good segmentation, go directly in the ganglion cell layer to look whether what's wrong and again, if you suspect the cystic spaces, look at the vertical scans of your macula and look where you can detect this cystic spaces. The loss of ganglion cells in this patient is again, nicely flagged out with the deviation map. Here we realize that we have lost ganglion cells in the upper and lower half of the raphe, but here it becomes much more and better visible. This is a very much progressed patient, 2009 to 14. I'm not able to see any change at the optic disc. On the right hand and left hand side, the posterior pole shows a very much thin um, retinal thickness. When we go into the follow up examination of the retinal thickness over many years, we realize the patient is below 50 microns in the mean thickness and doesn't show any progression. When we look at the patient with the HRT, we see, looking at rim area, that the patient is still showing progress we don't see with the nerve fiber layer. And when we look into the visual fields, we see that the patient also progresses with visual field loss, which is not mirrored by the retinal nerve fiber layer thickness loss. So when we look at the BMO, and the minimum rim width, we realize that the rim width is so small that here we can't see any progression anymore because there's nearly no tissue left to measure. So we have to take into account that in very far progressed cases, we end up with such a thin layer of nerve fiber layer of or minimum rim width that we don't see any progression. Here again, the deviation maps of the patient showing pronounced ganglion cell loss around the fovea and pronounced retinal nerve fiber layer loss. So a flooring effect, and that was the question we heard in the break, um, is a, um, important to, um, to be realized in OCT examination and in far progressed glaucomas, for example, I stopped doing nerve fiber layer thickness measurement and um, BMO MRW and look more into the visual field and look at the progression of the visual field. And of course, still use my old HRT with the TCA fl flagging out nicely, um, even in progressed uh, stages that progression happens. Well, acquisition time is a um, challenge. And in a very busy clinic, we have also had that question, it may at sometimes feeling like this very young man. So what kind of solution we have? Well, as I said, we have to look at the correlation between nerve fiber layer loss and visual feed defect. Here, when we have a progressed case with very thin nerve fiber layer, we still have progression with the visual field indices. And at a very early stage, we have a loss of nerve fiber layer thickness without progress in the um, visual field. So in very early or suspect cases, ocular hypertensives in this area, I would prefer the nerve fiber layer and then visual field 
beginning from 80 to 90 microns flags up. And in very progressed stages, when you have a thickness of the nerve fiber layer under 50 microns, then you have to watch the visual field for progression because here you have arrived at your flooring effect. Taking this into account, I would recommend in the early stages doing the nerve fiber layer and perhaps because of time and busyness, leave the other measurements alone. And if you have very much progressed cases, still visual field is worth doing photography because of disc hemorrhages and still the old HRT. And there are new papers telling that even OCT angiography may display and change in very far progressed change, um, patients. And intermediate, of course, we can use them all. The minimum room with Gangian cells, OCTA, visual field, and of course, the nerve fiber layer. So everybody has um, to decide what to do. And I would prefer to do um, the examinations on a stage basis. In early stages, leave some, um, some um, examinations alone. And for example, in very proud progress stages, doing the same for us, for example, the nerve fiber layer and concentrate more on other measurements. So um, a disc hemorrhage is always flagging out progression. And in OCT, sometimes you end up with a thickening of the retinal nerve fiber layer. And this setting doesn't show you any um, disc hemorrhage. When we look at the clinical picture of the same patient at the same day, you nicely see a very pronounced hemorrhage, which is not always shown in the infrared picture. You have, may expect about 50 to 60% of the hemorrhages being shown in the infrared picture. The others you won't see. Therefore, it's always it's important to look still at the clinical picture, to look at the disc photo. And of course, at, at first of all, a loss of nerve fiber layer is, of course, hidden. And then you end up with a very rapid loss of nerve fiber layer because the disc hemorrhages uh, goes away, diminishes, and afterwards, over years, the nerve fiber layer, li layer thickness loss happens. This is a patient with a preperiometric open angle glaucoma between 2009 and 17. We realized we had a disc hemorrhage here. We still have a slight disc hemorrhage here, and we have a pronounced loss of nerve fiber layer thickness in this dark area. Still, the visual field is not too bad. I do again the flickering of the disc, and you realize that the patient in the temporal inferior sector has um, worsened and a little bit in the temporal superior sector. When we look in our measurements, with um, minimum rim width, temporal superiorly, we see a decline of our line here, of the regression line showing that the patient has a problem. And when we look at the temporal inferior sector, we see a deterioration and suddenly everything seems to have become better. What, what has happened here? Here, I would recommend to look at the B scan. And what has happened here is, at the rim in um, cooperation with a uh, limiting membrane of the vitreous and vitreous phase has thickened because of splicing. But this kind of splicing most often occurs in areas where the tissue is already damaged, like the neutral rim or nerve fiber layer. But this fact is hidden if we don't look at the B scan. Here we realize that the patient really has a problem with his neutral rim, and but is hidden in the cause of the disease and in the trend analysis, because of course, in the segmentation, this area has thickened. When we look into uh, event-based analysis of, of this patient, of the retinal nerve fiber layer, we realize that the patient slowly is deteriorating from 2008 to 2017, slowly over the years. And when we look at the nerve fiber layer thickness trend of this patient, superior, inferior, we see a clear trend that the patient is losing tissue. So we take our referee 
we look at the ganglion cell layer and look what the ganglion cell layer tells us. And from 14 to 17, we realize that the patient in the heat map has lost ganglion cell layer thickness. And this is very helpful if we are not quite sure whether nerve fiber layer or minimum rim width shows us the true way. But again, deviation maps, 2014, 2017, and you nicely see that the patient shows a deterioration at the right place in the inferior hemifield, also flagging up the temporary inferior sector here in red, uh, beyond the 99% percentile. In this patient, you realize that he has a splicing of the nerve fiber layer and that the outer layers of the retina also show cystic, pseudocystic changes. This ends up with an automatic segmentation showing a much too thick vaginal nerve fiber layer. If you correct for it, you can try it. It's still too thick because you're not able to see where to put uh, the segmentation lines correctly. You can change it in your spectralis, that's a nice thing, but uh, what to do here? So here, you can go back to the HRT, you can go back to minimum rim width or look into a ganglion cell in a follow-up examination because nerve fiber layer thickness in this area is spoiled. When you look at the same patient I've shown you looking at the disc with the notching here, you realize that the visual field effect are much, is much more pronounced than the B scan would expect or let us expect. Again, the deviation maps of the same patient showing all the red area in the inferior hemifield showing a very pronounced ganglion cell layer defect. So the patient really has lost tissue and something has to be done. The slicing is a sign that the tissue is diseased and will thin in future, but in OCT segmentation, it is always shows a thickening and this may mislead us in our diagnosis. This um, has been published already from the New York group in 2011, showing, 11, showing this holes in the retinal nerve fiber layer, um, most often in the temporal superior and temporal inferior part of the um, optic disc and peripapillary retinal nerve fiber layer, of course, in these areas where nerve fiber layer is uh, 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 lost in a pronounced way. And this shows us that when the tissue is ill, these holes may appear. And this shows us just by the, looking at the qualitative um, examination of the B scan that something is going wrong. So what are glaucoma associated artifacts? Microcystic widening, widening of the internuclear layer, the flooring effect we have with nearly all our measurements, disc hemorrhages may mimic a thickening, although they hint towards a deterioration. And it's the same for splicing of nerve fiber layer and also of the rim in the area of focal defects of tissue, also a hint towards future deterioration. What are non-glaucoma associated factors influencing our measurements? When we look into this patient in 2011, February to December, right and left eye in the nerve fiber layer thickness measurement, we realized that the patient has, become, has um, got a thicker nerve fiber layer than in the first examination. And even here, this sector red, uh, flagging out in red has disappeared. What has happened? Well, you have already seen that something in the underground has happened. What's that? These are soft drusen changing over time. And when we look at the clinical picture, it's easier to understand that the soft drusen may flatten, may, may, may rise over time. And this seems to influence the segmentation of the retinal nerve fiber layer. That's a quite interesting phenomenon, phenomenon of course, very rare, but um, decisive to know. Of course, um, interaction with the vitreous, vit vitreous macular adhesions or tractions may, of course, influence the segmentation of the retinal nerve fiber layer, the innermost part of our retina, and gives way to pictures, beautiful pictures in the B scan, like that, like um, 
in the, the, the winter nights in the Nordic, uh, in Northern, Northern Europe or Northern Canada. And again, this um, comparison was made by Valentin Apostolov, supplying this very nice picture. So vitreous, uh, vitreoretinal tractions are a pain. The same is for epiretinal gliosis. Here on the fundus picture, you don't see anything being wrong. That's a glaucoma patient. But when you look at the OCT scan of the macula, you realize there's an epiretinal membrane uh, distorting the whole macular picture so uh, that you can't use the posterior pole scan for um, diagnosis or even follow-up measurements. In this publication, 2014, it has been shown that these kind of artifacts occur in B scans of the macula and the nerve fiber layer rather often. Between 15 to 36 percent of the scans may be affected, and most often the reason was an epiretinal membrane. When we have a, a very oblique disc, um, the Brooks membrane opening may lie very much to the temporal side, and if you take the shortest, dis shortest distance to the limiting membrane of the retina, then you realize that not only the rim is measured, but also the retinal protruded layers are measured. And in glaucoma, we wouldn't expect a change of this part of the retina, but of this part of the retina. But this uh, may lead to an artifact in follow-up examinations because um, you just not only measure the rim, but measure the whole retina. A myopic shift, as you all know, is a problem when you want to compare the myopic with the normative database. Therefore, we have a multi-center effort with Claude Bourgoin in order to um, collect these patients and improve the database. Due to the smaller angle kappa in a myopic eye, the maximum of the superior nerve fiber layer thickness and the inferior nerve fiber layer thickness move to the temporal side out of our normative range and you end up with very uh, distorted sectors not giving the right information because when you look at the b-scan of this patient it's a beautiful nerve fiber layer but it's the nerve fiber layer of a myopic person bmo is not this size this is something we had to learn after um, dealing with brooks membrane opening brooks membrane opening is invisible not visible to us we just see the ending of the sclera with a kind of um, Aeschnick sclera ring, and there's a discrepancy. This has been published in uh, Extenso, and if you compare in this um, work of Armenian colleagues and compare the opening of Brooks membrane with the um, real clinical disc size in relationship to Brooks membrane opening, you end up with a graph site like that because. Um, there are difference, especially in small and large discs, um, showing that these both measurements are not the same. And the funny thing is that in the OCT, the, uh, the OCT makes a very thin layer, like Brooks membrane, which is only two microns thick, look like much uh, thicker than the retinal pigmented epithelium layer, which has a thickness of nine to 12 microns. But this is due to the fact that in electron microscopy, Brooks membrane um, consists of different layers, may leading to a highly reflective uh, image in interaction with the laser light. BMO this size matters, and I will show you why. You have a very small disk and very large disk. In a very small disk, the rim width is on the high end of the normative database. In very large disks, the rim width is in the lower end of the normative database. And you can imagine that all this 1.2 million axons have to go to a smaller canal in small disk than in large disks. Large optic disks have a larger scleral canal and larger canal in the Brooks membrane opening. So that the nerve fibers um, are spread out a little bit thinner than in small discs, and therefore the measurements may be different according to the disc size. Again, micro disc ending up in the 
higher floor and macrodis are ending up in the smaller floor. There may be also differences if you choose the smaller scan size or the larger scan size. As you will realize in this patient, this patient has moved from borderline to normal by shifting the scan size to the periphery, which has this has also been taken into account. And the smaller disc size is still in most of the discs the preferred um, way to measure nerve fiber layer. In very large discs or myopic discs, it's more preferable to use the large one. Veteran vessels are pain because of the shadowing effect, as we all know. Here, ending of Brooks membrane opening can't be uh, measured exactly and has to be repositioned by the examiner. Also, here you see a, a very impressive shadowing effect by the retinal vessel. And we found in 2018 in a paper that we had in this paper to uh, recorrect our um, scans with the, at the optic nerve head in 84%. And it was less common in segmenting the retinal, resegmenting the retinal nerve fiber layer, which was only done in 13%. So always look at your B scans and then trust the measurement. So what are non-glaucoma associated factors? Changes in the vitreal retinal interface, macular degeneration, anatomy of the Brooks membrane opening, high myopes, this size matters, and segmentation issues. So this can lead to degeneration changes, changes in anatomy and differences, and of course, in issues with the software. So thank you very much for listening to the second part. And Stefan, we can take questions. Thank you, Christian. Very good. Um, actually, it's only time for one quick question um, to stay. It's going to be have lot, plenty of time at the end of the, the meeting. Um, we had before that a general question. Media opacities, dense cataract, affect the quality of scan and analysis of the results. I think you briefly mentioned it a little bit, but maybe you can give a comment until when it's working fine. It's uh, high wavelengths, isn't it? If you, uh, especially nuclear cataracts, don't affect um, the image that much. If you use art and do a repetition a hundred times, then you end up with a nice, clear picture. If you have subcapsular cataracts, then sometimes imaging is impossible because the image is very blurred. And then also um, art doesn't help you. But if you have cataract, you repeat your images. And if the quality is not fine, you have to do cataract surgery. Yeah. OK, um, we leave it with that one question for now. Um, 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 our timer counter, however you want to call it, fell to sleep. It doesn't want to count anymore. So um, you need to continue. You need your clocks. We do a quick break of three minutes and we'll be back at quarter past four. OK, so thank thanks you much, for everyone. a moment. See you in a minute, Christian. See you. Thank you. It's uh, really amazing. It's really amazing how short three minutes are. If you, <laughs> if you, if you, so, Ask them um, you think. <laughs> So your voice is back, Christian, so we need your cam as well to appreciate um, your enthusiastic presentation even better. So uh, while you uh, get online with your cam, here you are, wonderful. And actually, to be honest, not only three minutes are very, uh, very short. And while you uh, set up your presentation, and I confirm it's, it's all good visible, even 30 minutes are, if you present, really quite fast going by. We have lots of positive comments in the chat and questions for the end, of course. And so um, if you um, are ready, I see you are. Everything is nice to be seen. You, I kick off the third round of the trilogy. And these are now the optic neuropathies. Have fun. Stefan, thank you very much. We are now going to another topic other neuropathies. Most often patients are sent to us with being suspect glaucoma, 
And not uh, very rarely at the university hospital, you end up with quite another disease. So I just get you back to the right side. Excuse me for that. It always jumps. There we are. So we have to be um, aware of using our OCT also in other optic neuropathies. So when we look at the optic disc, the normal disc, okay, and glaucoma disc with the cupping, okay. But what happens when we have a very pale neurotic rim and the cupping is not enlarged, then we call this simple optic atrophy, having many, many reasons. And most often the reason for neurologic optic atrophies may be compressive, vascular, inflammatory, or neurodegenerative. So for us ophthalmologists using our ophthalmoscope and our OCT, still the rest of the optic nerve and the brain is like the dark side of the moon. We always look at the same side of the moon and we don't see the dark side. In order to see that, we of course have to look a little bit closer to the surface of the moon, but also use devices to look into the brain and the optic tract. So we use our natural nerve fiber layer, ganglion cells, visual field, OCTA for the, for the eye and the optic disc and the fundus. But we have to be aware of that if we have a degeneration in the optic tract, we have an anterograde valerian degeneration until the lateral geniculate nucleus, the layers become thinner, but we are also have to be aware of this in the meantime that we have a transsynaptic anterior degeneration leading up to the back part of our occiput to our brain. So for this, we use MRI scans with um, diverse modalities. And I will use always in my examples now also these MRI scans just to highlight that you have combined both. You have to combine in the multimodal way, multimodal way, our examinations with MRI in neurologic patients. First patient, when you look at the fundus, you will say, okay, looks nice. But of course, we are the errors. And when you look at the errors, you see that the patient has a pale optic disc on the temporal side. When we do the Goldman visual field, and that's a 42-year-old patient with a glioblastoma of the right brain, and we see this uh, vertical um, homonymous visual field defect in both eyes, vertically oriented. And the reason for all that is for the poor man, the glioblastoma of the right brain. When we look in our OCT measurements, then we realize that with nerve fiber layer and minimum rim width, we have everything in green sectors. And even if we look at the B scans, doesn't look bad, looks nice. Here's a, flector, a sector flagged out in yellow, but the rest is in green. But when we look at our posterior pole, what do we see? We see that homonymously to the right-hand side, the ganglion cell layer seems to be thicker, and to the left-hand side, the ganglion cell layer seems to be thinner. And when we look again in our love deviation maps, this becomes a little bit more clearer because we see that um, on the left-hand side, on the temporal side of the right eye, you have a thinning of the ganglion cells. And on the nasal side of the, length of the left eye, you have also a thinning of the ganglion cell layer in this patient. Again, the same vertical orientation as of individual field. And if we compare this Goldman visual field with the Hood report and adapt it to the 10 degree in the center, we nicely see that there where the visual field, field, uh, visual field is preserved, there uh, we have um, also the thicker ganglion cells and where the visual field has been lost, the ganglion cells have thinned. So a homonymous vertical orientation of nerve fiber layer defect or ganglion cell loss must you think of chiasmatic and post-chiasmatic several processes. And then you have to, of course, uh, do an MRI scan. 
Interestingly enough, 50 years ago, it was already suspected due to case studies that a transsynaptic degeneration in visual system may happen. When I started over 30 years ago, it seemed to be impossible to show that in grown-ups. But in the age of OCT, we rather often see this transsynaptic degeneration. If something happens uh, beyond the um, geniculate ganglion, then we might see it even with OCT in the eye. And here the ganglion cells are very sensitive to these changes. Here's a nice um, example from the literature by Stephen Schwartz in 2017. He showed a patient after a stroke on the right-hand side with the um, homonymous uh, field defects. And here is the ganglion cell layer thickness three months after the stroke, 30 months after the stroke, and then 70 months after the stroke. And here you see the vertical orientation, but it has taken 70 months until the OCT shows what already visual field showed from the beginning. The function loss in this case uh, precedes the uh, morphologic loss seen with the OCT. Here another example, another patient uh, with an infarction again on the right hand side and uh, due to the infarction uh, the brain had to be removed by the neurosurgeons on the right hand side partially. Again in this patient you realize the temporal panel um, optic disc, visual field, homonymous defect to the left hand side and if you look again and minimum rim width at the nerve fiber layer of both eyes, everything in green, B scans, nice, posterior pole looks nice, and even in the deviation maps, we just see the small areas with, which don't uh, fit to our visual field effects. Even if we take into account the Hood report, it doesn't fit this time to our visual field effect. Why? Well, transsynaptic regenerative degeneration is not as rare as previously thought, but it does not happen in every patient with purely retrogaliculate lesions. This has been nicely published by Meyer in the, uh, in the German edition of the Clinician Monats Better Augenheilkunde. So in this case, we would have expected a transsynaptic degeneration, but it didn't happen. This is important to know. This is a patient sent to us for cataract surgery in combination with an eye stand because IOP was, well, was not too bad, but the disc was pale. So when we have a look at the paleness of the optic disc, it doesn't really look like glaucoma, and the paleness is pronounced in the upper, feel, upper hemifield of the disc, and the lower part doesn't look so, too bad. Interesting, the visual field shows us a hemifield defect oriented to the horizontal line in both eyes. So we suspect, of course, in this case, simple optic atrophy anterior, un, uh, after anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. And then, of course, we do a fluorescine angiography and we realize that the upper part of the disc where we have the pale areas, uh, we have dark areas in the fluorescine angiography, no perfusion. So it would fit to an ion diagnosis. When we look at our OCT, we see that the ganglion cell thickness on both eyes is quite nice in the inferior part, which is preserved, but in the upper part where the atrophy has happened, also the ganglion cells show atrophy. Both in the B scans, of course, also in the posterior pole and in the mineral rim width, not much happens, but in the nerve fiber layer, you see more effects. The same is true for the other eye, the left-hand eye, Retinal nerve fiber layer in red, and here just the nasal sector in red. Why? Because the cupping nearly doesn't increase in simple optic atrophy. The rim flattens, but the size of the rim sometimes may be uh, measured to be normal. But the nerve fiber layer, of course, and the ganglion cells, they suffer from this ischemic attack and they diminish. Again, deviation maps nicely flagged out the ganglion solas pronounced in the upper hemifield on the right hand eye, but also on the left hand eye, a little bit in the lower hemifield. That means that the ischemic 
um, stroke of the optic disc not only has taken account the upper part, but also a little bit of the lower part. This is due, of course, to the Sinhala circle we all know from anatomy, where the upper circle and the lower circle, and most often in anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, the upper or lower circle um, has an infarction. So when we have a horizontal orientation of neural atrophy in visual field, and also Gangnam says a neural um, nerve fiber layer, then think of an ischemic um, stroke of the optic disc and not on glaucoma. We have, of course, also performed um, MRI scan and in your DTI scan highlighting the optic track, we see that the optic track in this patient has become rather thin. And of course, the, there is a general optic and uh, brain atrophy of this patient. This is a patient with glaucoma. Okay, why do I show a glaucomatous patient in this part of the talk? Well, the patient has progressed glaucoma in both eyes, no doubt. Unfortunately, also a macular degeneration. When we look at his brain, we realize that he has increase of flare in the area of the optic tract, and that in the DTI imaging of the optic tract, here the optic tract stops. There is a problem in the tract, and this is a trans we call it a transsynaptic degeneration due to glaucoma. Here, there's a lot of discussion because some people say, okay, but it's the same process going on in the brain and the optic nerve head. Some people say it's a trans transsynaptic degeneration. But we also have to realize when we deal with this MRI pictures and also with DTI imaging, that also our glaucoma patients may cause a thinning of the optic tract. Let's get to another disease, multiple sclerosis, a, a very common disease, of course, seen in, in centers like in university centers. And these patients are well examined also by our neurologist friends with OCT. They even perform their own OCT examinations because they, in early stages, they can see changes in multiple sclerosis, and it's a very good tool for following up the patient. So here we realize that, especially in the papillomacular macular bundle, we have our problem similar to um, Parkinson's disease. The parvocellular pathway is um, damaged and we see a slight thinning with the minimum rim width on both eyes in this pa patient with multiple sclerosis, but a more pronounced thinning of the retinal nerve fiber layer on the temporal side, rather typical for this disease. When we look at the deviation maps, we get a round atrophy around the fovea of ganglion cells, uh, both eyes in this patient. And also this patient showed microcystic changes in the, the inner nuclear layer, happens in glaucoma, other optic atro atrophies, but also rather often in multiple sclerosis being a prognostic a negative indicator for the progression. Again, I highlight these red areas in deviation maps and Martin Long has coined the word, uh, the expression purple eye pattern in multiple sclerosis. This may also happen in other diseases. Uh, if you see that in deviation maps, first of all, you have to think of this disease. We take again into account that our macrocellular ganglion cells are damaged in glaucoma and, of course, in Alzheimer's disease. But the parvocellular pathway in the papillomacular bundle most often is damaged by multiple sclerosis or Parkinson's disease. And this is exactly the area we have highlighted with our OCT. And, of course, we don't forget that we have still have a whole optic tract here we have the transition to the fourth neuron and that we may happen to see transsynaptic um, degeneration. Another patient, again, and 
I always emphasize and always start with the clinical picture because we are clinicians. We are able to look at the optic disc with all the AI of our brain. And if you have a dilated pupil, you see the paleness. It's not surprising that the patient may have something neurologic. It's not first seen by OCT. This patient has a paleness. This patient has a rather good visual field. And when we look at our posterior pole, we realize that we have a slight thinning of the ganglion cell layer to the temporal side. We still have a good measurement of the minimum rim width, retinal nerve fiber layer, and the same is true for the left eye. This patient has multiple sclerosis and has never had an episode of optic neuritis. But when we look at the deviation maps, it becomes clear that the patient has the beginning purple eye pattern on the right hand eye and on the left hand eye. So this atrophy of the ganglion cells and multiple sclerosis already happened before uh, changes, uh, before an optic neuritis may have happened or other changes of the nerve fiber layer may occur. The MRI of this patient highlights the demyelination defects of the brain. And we performed an OCT and angiography in this patient. And what we realized is that in the superficial layers, as already published in literature, we have a loss of vessel density in this patient. The green line is our normative database. This was also done with the Spectralis 2 OCT angiograph and our own software. And even in the intermediate layer, we have a um, lightly diminished um, density of the uh, retinal vessels and the capillary bed in OCTA, of course, reflective, uh, reflecting the change in the ganglion cell layer, especially in the superficial layer. And again, in this patients, the small pseudocystic changes of the inner nuclear layer. This is complicated drusen. So the, this looks swollen. If you dilate the pupil, have a close look in elderly patients, we see the drusen. In younger patients, they are buried. They are not seen as easily. We can use the old-fashioned echography to light them up, or we can use autofluorescence to light them up also to diagnose the drusen. This patient is 33 years old, has a quite good vision still. And when we look at the minimum rim width measurements of this patient on both eyes, we realize that the minimum rim width is over normal because, of course, we have thickening of the optic, small optic disc of the rim due to the drusen. And the drusen are nicely seen here, buried in the optic disc. And when we look at the little nerve fiber layer, we realize that patient really has complicated drusen because nerve fiber layer is lost. And this loss of nerve fiber layer occurs with um, increasing age due to the very small um, scleral canal and the drusen leading to an atrophy of the original nerve fiber layers. This can also end up in visual field defects. And when we look at this, Brooks membrane opening, it's still smaller than normal. 1.8 would be the mean, and this patient had 1.7 square millimeter. And of course, because of the thickening of minimum rim width, this measurement does not match at all with the nerve fiber layer loss to the drusen. And when we look at the visual field, we have this chaotic visual field defects not fitting in any scheme of glaucoma and other neuropathies. Again, with our deviation maps, we are able to realize the ganglion cell loss associated with the nerve fiber layer loss, posterior pole, and nice cells visible in the deviation maps. Again, when we look at the Hood report, we realize that in our patient, the area where the ganglion cells are lost more pronouncedly, we have the visual feed effect, and the same is here to the temporal side, here we have the visual feed effect. It's quite useful sometimes if you don't have, I can't imagine that, to use the Hood report to um, correlate function and morphology. This patient has had 
an anterior ischemic optic neuropathy due to a um, Horton's disease. And if the patient has had Horton's disease and apoplexia of the optic disc, then the optic disc becomes pale, but it becomes blurry. And this blurriness doesn't go away and turn into a um, simple optic atrophy with clearly defined um, boundaries. No, it becomes blurred because in these patients, rather often the astrocytes start to proliferate and the disc um, swells a little bit and looks swollen, but it's just a pseudo swelling due to astrocyte proliferation. The axles are lost. And therefore, you may end up similar to Drusen with a very, very thick minimum rim width showing a, everything is fine, but the retinal nerve fiber layer, of course, is pathologic. And if you see this discrepancy with your OCT imaging, um, you have to think of also um, ischemic diseases, which may have happened to the patient. So BMO MRRW is high, nerve fiber layer is low. And this cartoon from Naumann's book of pathology of the eye indicates the astrocyte proliferation and at the same time the loss of axons due to the ischemia. There are of course other reasons for optic atrophy and this is a quite nice paper comparing Leber's optic neuropathy with autosomal dominant optic neuropathy from the view of the OCT. And of course in acute labor we have a swelling of the disc therefore the nerve fiber layer is also swollen and the ganglion cells already flag out that there's a problem, but the nerve fiber layer comes later on in the disease when atrophy happens, when also nerve fiber layer and ganglion cells in the same time show atrophy. In autosomal dominant atrophy, interesting, the authors point out that the ganglion cell loss is a little bit more pronounced than the thinning of the retinal nerve fiber layer, which this fact has to be taken into account and I think in my future patients I will have a, a closer look whether this is true or not. It's an interesting finding. So patterns of ganglion cell loss and orientation of atrophy. I would like to summarize what I have said. So in glaucomas, Alzheimer's disease, you most often end up with an accurate uh, loss in the upper or lower hemifield of um, ganglion cells. Um, being a sign of the ascending atrophy of the optic nerve. If you have a chiasmal or retrochiasmal vertical orientation of your visual feed defects, you also end up with a vertical orientation of your ganglion cell loss. And most often you have to deal then with a descending optic atrophy. You need by all means an MRI scan. And if you have an um, anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, then you have the horizontal orientation of your visual field defects and also most often the horizontal orientation of your ganglion cell defects showing of course an ascending atrophy. And if you have uh, the purple eye pattern in the center with a ring-like loss of ganglion cells, then you have to be aware of multiple sclerosis, Leber's optic neuropathy, Parkinson's disease, and this, of course, may be a reason from an ascending or descending atrophy. If you want to summarize the difference between glaucoma and simple optic atrophy um, with OCT, then most of the cases you find an even loss of nerve fiber layers, ganglion cell layer, and BMO, MRW, rim thickness. Um, in a similar severity in glaucomas with all three measurements. In contrast, in simple optic distal atrophy, you have a pronounced loss of ganglion cells, pronounced loss of nerve fiber layer, perhaps a little bit less, but most often minimum rim width or the thickness of the rim is not a um, defected or um, has a problem because the excavation and cupping doesn't get larger, the rim becomes flatter, becomes pale, but most of minimum rim width doesn't flag out what we would like, expect with ganglion cell layer and nerve fiber layer thickness. 
And this was published also by colleagues from our department in 2015. So is that all true? Well, we have to realize that in 6.5% of our patients with normal tension glaucoma, clinically relevant compressive lesions may be found. found. And in 6.8% of patients with intracellular tumors, a glaucomatous optic atrophy has been found. And taking into account these two publications, we always perform in our normal tension glaucomas MRI scanning in order not to overlook any brain problem. So when we don't have a good matching of minimum rim width nerve fiber layer ganglion cell, then we have to think of possible reasons. Of course, neuronal diseases, Go again, look at the disc, is there a cupping or just a temporal pale area? Look at the visual field. And not only in the um, 30 degree visual field of glaucomas, but also perform a Goldman um, perimetry in the old fashioned way, where the neurology, neurologic diseases nicely flag up. And of course, in these cases, MRI scans are highly recommended to be done. So I hope with this three part, the mission is accomplished of our trilogy. Thank you for listening. It was a pleasure and it will be a pleasure to take up your questions. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Christian. I was just thinking it was a pleasure. You still have to stay because we have lots of questions and lots of interaction. And um, um, But I want to start with with one comment, one of many, I have to say one out of many, and this is coming, I think, from India. This has been the, the in capitals, most informative and useful OCT and glaucoma presentation I have attended. I don't know if in the last week or entire life or today, <laughs> but- uh, Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. <laughs> uh, it's, of course, uh, very uh, motivational, just because very often the question comes up about, uh, hands out, etc. Yes, this will be recorded and you see the email address uh, in our, uh, you saw it many times and you will see later. If you go to our business lounge, to our virtual academy site, you can register for the newsletter, which informs you about more um, uh, events with, uh, with stars, so to speak, in ophthalmology and all relevant, I can promise. So take that opportunity, sign in for the newsletter and don't miss any of those or just check our webpage on a regular basis and register for upcoming courses. And um, saying that, um, um, I want to point uh, the, your attention once more on the possibilities to interact now. And I put now, um, well, I put now all hands down, Professor Sherpa, if you want to speak up again, if it was not an accident, raise your hand up again. I put all hands down, and now we try uh, the first questions to take them by the hands, okay? Professor uh, uh, Sharpa um, confirmed that I put you online for your first online question, please. Uh, thank you, thank you. It was an excellent, um, excellent uh, presentation. And uh, do you think that, uh, what do you do in normal tension glaucoma? Do you do OCT, visual field, and uh, MRI all together, or just uh, OCT and MRI? No, um, the normal tension glaucoma patients have the problem that they have their visual field defects very near to the center of their fixation, and they, 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 they really see their visual field defects, and therefore uh, we always um, take the visual fields also in order to see whether the patient gets into more problems driving a car or doing his everyday work. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your question. We will have the next uh, person in, online in a second, but meanwhile, we take a question from the panel. And uh, India is waiting, or Indian colleague is waiting since almost one and a half hours for an answer to the following question. In one of the other webinars, of course, not uh, from uh, spectralysis, he writes, I listened uh, to someone say ganglion cell layer thinning at posterior pole shows, shows up before any nerve fiber loss at the disc. And hence, this is more important to measure the diagnose early. 
um, glaucoma uh, way before there is field loss or notching at disc or even elevated IOP. So this is the earliest sign. We had that a little bit discussed, but can you discuss again? What is coming before what? What is your recommendation here? Um, in, in, my, in my personal opinion, and what I know from literature and discussions is that an early glaucoma, really the nerve fiber layer would flag out first, and then immediately afterwards the ganglion cell layer. In neurologic diseases, ganglion cell, cell layer most often flags out first, and then the nerve fiber layer afterwards. Okay, so we have the next uh, question from Irene Leung, and I have you on the speaker, please, your question now. Hello. Good evening. Irene, can you hear me? I think this was a clicking accident. Okay. And uh, so uh, the other person went quick offline before I could put her <laughs> on the microphone, so we continue with questions from the panel. And, and uh, there's another uh, good one, uh, but before we come to the good ones, uh, a little bit feedback. Um, oh, yeah, yes, the, the, le the, the, the attendee who made the comment, the best uh, OCT lecture said in her entire life, so just to make that <laughs> sure. So um, uh, we don't know Thank if she's much. 18 or 80. But, uh, uh, she must be 13. Okay. 13. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, fantastic presentation, fantastic presentation. It says excellent presentation, outstanding presentation, amazing presentation. Enough from amazing and outstanding, go back to a question. And the next question is, uh, thank you for a clear and succinct lecture. Please discuss. Number one, so these are not, we have more than one question, okay? This hemorrhage is in the absence of glaucoma, maybe it's to start with. Yes, disc hemorrhages in the absence of glaucoma happen, especially when you have an interaction with the vitreous. And if you have a vitreal attraction, then uh, disc hemorrhages appear because you have Martigiani's ring at the disc. And if, if this, there is attraction by the vitreous, you really see disc hemorrhages. And you see them much easier if the patient takes anti anticoagulation therapy. Yes, it happens. Okay. Good. And the second question um, is about the problems with large discs and, and tilted discs. Um, we have limitations due to missing normative data or poor normative data, it's, it's said here. And then is the question, can the machine quantify or detect the tilted disc? And before you answer, I just want to say there has been, it has been presented in the presentation. The machine can never do anything without you as a doctor. So it's both. It needs you and the machine, and maybe you can uh, clarify a little bit on how you deal with large and tilted discs. Yes, when, when you have large um, disc, then I would recommend to take the largest um, ring scan for the nerve fiber layer and look into the ganglion cells. But then you have to realize in a highly myopic patient that also the ganglion cells are much thinner than in normals, and that these patients also show it thinning of nerve fiber layer and ganglion cells, although they have no glaucoma at all, just by myopia. And that's very, very tricky and very uh, difficult. In very large discs, again, I would take um, the, the larger ring and again, look at the ganglion cells in order to get an idea whether it's still a normal or already glaucomatous disc. I'm very much biased in that topic because I always look at the optic disc and the rule of Jonas, and then I most often get an idea about the patient. And then I look and try to co correlate it to my OCT findings. Okay, great. I have one more comment I want to share with the community. And this is, can I just say that this has been a brilliant set of three lectures. The go-to webinar format is way better than Zoom and the five minute breaks were a fantastic idea. I wish you guys run your, our meeting. Well, it's always a question of neg yeah. negotiation if we can run your meeting. So contact us and we might make you a good yeah. offer. Anyway, that was a kind a of business. Talk. Uh, but uh, we have questions, and we have questions from Italy, actually three of them in a row. So I'll give you three short questions and three short answers uh, I think are possible. May I ask why in larger discs 
we should use 4.7 millimeter diameter for the analysis of, analysis of the cell. Well, when you measure the um, measure the nerve fiber layer very near to the disc, then you made up with too small measurements or too low measurements because the spread of the neutral nerve fiber layer is thinner than in a normal optic disc. The far you go to the periphery, this difference becomes less obvious and visible. Okay, and the next question is, um, do you prescribe anti glaucomatous drops? Thank you for some questions like this, not only imaging related, in patients with RNFL damage secondary to optic disc drusen. Yeah, well, the problem is that we can't really do something good for the pa these patients, but what we in fact do, as you do, uh, we try to lower the interocular pressure with um, eye drops where we expect a better, um, like carbo anhydrous inhibitors, a, a better circulation, retinal circulation or um, neuroprotection. And we try that, the patient gets the idea that something has to be done, it can be done. And um, if the patient tolerates the eye drops well, we really do that and try and hope that the um, deterioration of nerve fiber layer thickness and the atrophy becomes a little bit slower than faster. And the last question uh, from the same person from Italy is, um, do you have any tricks in cases of advanced, very advanced uh, optic disc atrophy? How can we orientate ourselves and investigate what the original diagnosis was? If you have very um, progressed optic disc with a huge cupping, well, the, the, the glaucoma, the, the only diagnosis can be then, of course, glaucoma. And is the question more to, towards the progression in these eyes or to the diagnosis? Because there are many reasons leading to glaucomas. High pressure, low pressure, there may have been high pressures in the 30s and 40s of years, and in the 70s, the pressure is fine again, but the disc is gone. This also happens in pigmentary glaucoma rather often. I don't know whether this was the question. She was asking in any optic neuropathy when diagnosis is not sure but atrophic disc present. That was the yes. And question. then you have to decide whether it's a simple optic atrophy with a preserved cupping and a pale rim, or whether it's um, a large cupping with a normal looking rim. Then uh, I would differentiate between simple and atrophy and glaucoma. And of course, the reason for simple optic atrophy can be multifold and you have to do a lot of examinations to find that out, that's true. Okay, I have two hands up as well. So let's try again if we get someone live on the microphone. I think uh, Mr. Patel, you are first. Hello, can you hear us? You hear? How, how, yes. What percentage of pre-perimetric um, patients do you start on glaucoma medication? When the patient uh, flags out pre-perimetric, it means that we have a um, glaucomatous disc and we have at least one typical sector, superior or inferior temporally, then we would start medication even before visual field defects occur. Yes. Okay. Question answer. Um, uh, next person, um, Raquel, you are now live if you want i click you yeah, now oh, right. oh. sorry raquel this is not possible for whatever reason maybe you don't have a microphone so raising the hand was not helpful anyway so we move on to the questions um, um okay so the question we just answered she is italian but lives in the uk so again uh Differential, we got the differential diagnosis wrong in this case. <laughs> anyway, so we have more questions. Um, and the next question is, um, uh, the excellent question, optic head stresses and early papillar edema, how can we differentiate? Optic head stresses, I'm not sure if I understand the question. Do you? 
Um, papilla edema? Early papilla edema compared to optic heart head stresses. Yes. Um, the papilla edema I left out this time because of time, but in papilla edema, most often you have a full visual acuity, you have a normal visual field, enlarged blind spot, and in OCT, which is our topic today, the BMO MRW is enlarged, of course, and the retinal nerve fiber layer is enlarged also, but you have no functional defect and the ganglion cells are nice. If you have a papilla edema due to uh, compression by a tumor or other reason which um, is inflammatory or ischemic, then you always have a functional loss. And then you can also look in thinning of nerve fiber layer in the cause of the examination or in the thinning of the ganglion cells. If you have a very long standing benign papilla edema and you don't treat it, then of course you end up after one or two years, depending on the pressure, also with simple optic atrophy and loss of um, neural um, rim thickness. And therefore, we measure the height of the optic disc, nerve fiber layer thickness, and ganglion cells. Okay, we have a COVID-19 question. What are your recommendations performing uh, visual fields? <laughs> totally different question. How do you do yeah, that? That's right. Um, in, in this case, um, at the moment, we are very reluctant in performing visual fields. If we don't have to, we don't do. And we try to do the imaging. And this, at the moment, I think is perhaps um, a good thing about imaging because uh, visual fields I would postpone at the moment. And I've done yesterday. A patient came with the same question. I said, no, not at the moment. Come back in three months. And we look how COVID-19 behaves in, in, the, in, in the public. It's easier to, to have control over the patient when you do the imaging, with, like with the OCT. That's right, yeah. Yeah. Okay, um, there are more questions, and we only have two minutes. Let's see how much we can cover. Uh, there are five more questions, but maybe we can't cover all of them, and we try to, to reply to you after. Um, how does OCT look different in papilla edema? I think this has been just answered, um, I would say. Uh, in the previous in the previous question, what investigation do you find most useful in distinguished early glaucoma in myopic tilted disc? Yeah, very difficult, dif very difficult question. And um, I have to say, in these eyes, I use TCA with HRT and the visual field. Okay. Do you have any experience with patient OCT evaluation of MS patients treated with? Uh, Chilena, Chilenia or other medication or in another field of neuropathy? Yes, there, um, I have read publications that um, the rate of deterioration uh, has been shown to the slope becomes flatter, that's right. But I have no personal um, um, experience with that. Would you treat pre parametric glaucoma or just monitor? No, um, in Germany we treat pre-parametric glaucoma. I know that in the English-speaking English -speaking countries, visual fields are important, but we want to avoid that and therefore we treat pre-parametric glaucoma, yes. Would you start treatment if PX has normal discs, normal IOPs, normal fields, but OCT is suggestive of suspect glaucoma suspect? Similar question, isn't it? Similar questions. And if I can't decide to treat the patient, for whatever reason, then closely monitor the patient, for example, in the first year, every three months with visual field and your OCT examinations, and then look at the slope, whether the patient deteriorates or not. Do you wait to demonstrate progression of NFL change before being sure it is pre-parametric glaucoma? Yeah. Um, yes, um, I think the, the first example I've shown um, that the patient was still in the green and then turned into yellow and then in the red afterwards and in the beginning in the trend analysis you already saw that the patient was deteriorating in the green area before the patient entered the yellow area so if you have a trend like that the patient is still in a normative good range but is deteriorating then this would be a, an example of p-parametric deterioration yes 
three more quick questions, then we have everything answered. But uh, with optic disclusion and field defects, we should start on CAH or primon primonidine or both? Um, if primonidine is tolerated, I prefer primonidine and then the second, uh, the first um, medication you, you said. Yeah. Primonidine is, is fine. Yeah. What is the significance of the ganglion cells hemifield comparison table in glaucoma? What is the cutoff value? Difficult. I can't answer. I look always at the grayscale, but um, I have no numbers in mind. Okay, and last one. Please, could you briefly touch on the tilted disc analysis? I think you did already, but maybe one take home message once more because that everyone understands. So, if you have a myopic tilted disc, um, look at the ganglion cells, look at a good segmented uh, nerve fiber layer. Um, ring scan and um, of course visual field and still the HRT in my eyes is a very good option to see the changes in the surface morphology of the disc. Question, we are through the questions um, a little bit in a hurry thank but you. nevertheless we could try to answer all of them and I thank you so much for being interactive and for these all these nice comments um, to the enthusiastic German guys, as some people mentioned. <laughs> In the, it was a great pleasure. We had over 1,000 registrations today. And so I hope uh, you enjoyed and um, uh, we enjoy, you enjoyed uh, your um, the trilogy. And there's more to come. Check it out on our webpage. Thank you to Claude Your in, in, the, in the back. And now I'm hurrying up to the next uh, session and Christian we have a chat later on. Uh, we can't have a beer together right now but uh, no. hopefully in, in the future. Thank you Christian. Hopefully. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye bye. bye, -bye.